Good morning. Welcome to Trading R. I'm Reema Tendulkar. With me is Sonia Shinoy and markets are recovering. We're back in the green. In the morning, there was a knee-jerk reaction. At the session lows, the Nifty was down 150 points and now we're up close to about 30-odd points. And even the Adani Group stocks pulled them up. Again, uh, in the morning, there was a gap down opening. Stocks were down close to about uh, you know, 4 or 5% for many of them. And now they're cutting their losses. And the big recovery seen in the banking names. So the Nifty Banking Index is up 200 points with names like Kotak Mahindra Bank, HDFC Bank fighting for the bulls. For HDFC Bank in particular, there is also that MSCI Rejig announcement, which is expected at 3.30 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, so there is an expectation that HDFC banks' weight, weightage will go up. So there are likely to be inflows. So some pre-buying is seen in names like HDFC Bank. And according to Nuvama, some of the other potential candidates uh, for an inclusion are Vodafone Idea, RVNL. And these are some stocks where there is buying today. Oh, absolutely. And what a morning, right? Yeah. After all that happened over the weekend with the Hindenburg report, with all of the talk back and forth, the market has recovered and how? I mean, the Nifty has actually recovered about 200 points from the lows that we saw. It's back above the 24,000, uh, almost at 24,400 now. Uh, so it's really interesting to see how this market just climbs every wall of worry. It has a, you know, a single point razor focus, so to speak, which is uh, to, you know, sort of get over every hurdle. And the buy on dips is something that this market is seeing. By the way, I just want to make a spe special mention to Ola Electric as well. It's day two of Ola Electric and it is once again on upper circuit. So clearly the market keeping the faith with this one, looking at um, you know a lot of the uh, recovery that we've seen in this stock. So, uh, or rather recovery in uh, you know the kind of uh, sentiment, right? Mm. I mean, the, it's gone <coughs> through so much, this company. First, the valuations were scaled down and then you had, uh, you know, other issues as well with respect to losses, etc. But uh, since listing, it's just been up, up and away. Indeed. And it's taken a lot of people by surprise too, right? No one anticipated yes. that day one, listing day and day two is going to be so strong for the markets. But it's a big day in terms of individual stock reactions. So there is Voltas on the way up reacting to their numbers on the way down. There's some TV disappointing numbers. And let's also talk about Balakrishna Industries. Uh, how were the numbers, Sonia? So the earnings were largely in line with estimates. Okay. There were no problems with the earnings. But the commentary is what is muted and that's something that has resulted in the stock being under pressure right now. Uh, if you look at it, the margins have actually improved to about 24.4% versus 23.2%. And the estimate was about 24.6%. So largely in line numbers, slightly improvement in margins, etc. But the volume growth is in line with estimates as well. It was not a bad volume growth. 24% volume growth is what the company has seen. But I think it's the cautious commentary that has caused the stock to be a bit subdued this morning. So if you look at what the management is saying, right, they're talking about softening of demand. They're talking about very minor sales volume growth in FY25, so hardly any growth. The demand is tepid. There are macro challenges. The channel inventory is increasing. And they will strive for maintaining EBITDA margins of last year. So I think it's this cautious commentary that the street doesn't like. Let me quickly take you through what brokerages have made of the numbers. Morgan Stanley has an underweight. Uh, they have a target price of 2,133. Investec has a sell with a target of 2,360. And Nomura has a neutral with a target of 3,115. And this uh, stock generally has a propensity to disappoint, uh, either in terms of you know the numbers or the commentary. And whenever there is a disappointment, the stock reaction is quite adverse. And that's pretty much what we're seeing this morning. But on the flip side, Jubilant Foodworks has hit a new high. Honasa Consumer is also in focus on the back of Q1 numbers. Mangalam is here with the details. Mangalam, over to you. Well, good numbers coming in from Jubilant Foodworks, especially given the sort of uh, environment that we're currently in. The company has reported, you know, 3% like-for-like -like growth in the street, was working with a number of 2 to 3% as well. Higher At the higher end of expectations is what the company has reported. But, you know, you should not look at just that 3%. Beneath the surface, there's a fair amount of strength. Uh, the delivery like-for-like -like growth has come in at around 12.1%, and that accounts for nearly 70% of their sales. Add to that, if you look at all the other QSR players this time around, barring Burger King, which did a like-for-like -like growth of close to around 3%. You know, Westlife reported a decline of about 7%. Uh, whichever way you look at either Devyani or Sapphire, Pizza Hut and KFC saw a decline of around 7 to 9 odd percent as well. So in that, the outperformance of Domino's really stands out. Uh, the reported numbers as well, you know, the ne revenue is closer to 1440 crores, above street expectations, the EBITDA at around 280 crores, in line with expectations, is even the, the net profit a little over 51 odd crores as well. The key internals were strong as well, with them having added nearly 34 Domino stores during this quarter. At the same time, they've added around eight Popeye stores, so the Popeye uh, franchise has now moved to around uh, 50 odd stores itself. 
And uh, the acquisition of DP Eurasia panning out well too with Domino's Turkey showing double digit like for like and the beverage brand Coffee has also seen a near 7 to 8 percent sort of like for like growth. So with all of this, the street believes that going forward, maybe, you know, the worst is behind uh, Jubilant Foodworks. And as a result of which, we've seen a couple of brokerage upgrades come by this morning as well. The most notable one from Jefferies. Thank you very much for that. Let's... Okay, before that, let's also talk about uh, Honasa Consumer. How did the numbers look? Because the stock is under pressure. Well, the numbers look good, no two ways about that. But, you know, the stock is under pressure on account of the near-term uncertainty that the company has spoken about. So, if you just take a look at the results, you know, 19.3% revenue growth led by nearly 25% volume growth is something uh, that is much higher than the industry and it's pretty strong as well. And that's led to a 58% jump in the EBITDA margin improvement of almost 200 basis points and a near 60% jump in the net profit as well. What really the street does not like is uh, one there could be near-term uncertainty with regards to their distribution revamp that may impact sales by about 100 to 150 basis points over the next couple of quarters and secondly the ad spends uh, year on year the ad spends have actually come in at 36 percent of sales versus 35 percent the company believes that you know uh, further downside to this could be limited just to about 70 80 basis points as they are guiding for 20 percent revenue growth in uh, normalized quarters with 150 basis points margin improvement so in the very near term this inventory related uncertainty has the stock uh, sulking in today's trading session but the numbers are pretty strong we've seen good market share gains across mama earth as well as new products doing about nine percent of their overall sales okay thanks a lot for that so hanasa uh, down almost about four odd percent strong earnings but management commentary muted Voltas is the other one which is doing exceptionally well this morning. 6% higher on the back of a very strong set of Q1 numbers. Upasana is joining in with more details on that. Upasana, over to you. Thanks so much for that. Voltas reported strong set of numbers in its Q1 FI25 above street estimates. Strong growth was mainly driven by the company's UCP segment, which is nearly 77% of the sales. EMPS segment also recovered sharply this quarter and turned positive. Now coming to revenues first, the revenue stood at 4,921 crores with an uptick of 47% on a one-way basis. EBITDA saw growth of nearly 1.3 times at 424 crore leading to a sharp EBITDA margin expansion of 310 basis points at 8.6%. Pat stood at 335 crores with an uptick of nearly about 1.6 times. Now coming to company's key segment, first up is UCP segment, which was the key growth driver, as stated earlier, recorded a strong revenue growth of 51% on a one year basis and margins in this segment also expanded by 40 basis points at 8.6%. Company's EMPS segment turned positive and revenue growth was about 40% on a one year basis and margins turned positive at 7%. And lastly, company's engineering products and services segment saw revenue growth of about 13%, but margins declined by 100 basis points at 28% on a one year basis. So all in all, strong set of numbers reported by Waltas in its Q1 FI25. Okay, thanks a lot, Upasna, for that. Appreciate it. Let's slip into a short commercial break. On the other side, we'll put the spotlight on the big story, Hindenburg research allegations against the SEBI chairperson. More on that coming up. Welcome back to Trading Hour on CNBC TV 18. Well, Hindenburg Research has put allegations on Sebi Chairperson on counts of conflict of interest with regards to the Adani Group and questioned her credibility in investigating Hindenburg's allegations against the Adani Group. Nisha has been tracking the story from the word go. She gets us the full account. Nisha, over to you. Yes, thanks for that. Hindenburg Research's recent report puts allegations on SEBI Chief Madhvi Puri Butch by highlighting her conflict of interest with Adani Group and therefore raising some serious questions on her credibility. While SEBI Chairperson has refuted claims by pointing to disclosure 
and recusal norms she has diligently followed. Now, Hindenburg alleges Madhavi and her husband Dhawal had investments in two funds which they claim have been used by Adani Group for siphoning of funds. Now, they highlight the involvement of 361 in managing these funds and report suggests that the first investment in 2015 while Madhavi joined SEBI in 2017. Now, by establishing these linkages, Hindenburg claims that SEBI has been reluctant to probe Adani because of chairperson's involvement. Now, SEBI chief, in her strong rebuttal, has denied these claims and explained that investments in fund was in 2015 as private citizens and states emphatically that at no point did the fund invest in Adani Group's companies. Now, in another point of conflict of interest, the report claims that Butch had interest in offshore Singapore consulting firm Agora Partners and continued with her ownership of Agora Partners despite being SEBI's whole time member. Now, Madhavi said that all disclosures and recusal norms of SEBI were followed, refuting the charges of the conflict. Not just Singapore entity, but even the Indian entity Agora Advisory India and Hindenburg claims that Butch has 99% stake in the Indian consulting firm, which, remember, is generating nearly two crores from advisory services in FY22, is what the report claims. Now, SEBI chief clarified by saying that the two consulting companies became immediately dormant on her appointment with SEBI and that her shareholding in them were explicitly part of her disclosures to SEBI. Now, apart from linkages to Adani Group, the report also claims that Madhavi had conflict of interest with global private equity firm Blackstone and Hindenburg's report says that Madhavi Butch used her position to benefit Blackstone in REITs in India and that her husband Dhawal Butch is acting as an advisor to Blackstone despite no experience in funds or capital markets. Here again, Sebi Chief clearly refutes claims by disclosing that Blackstone Group was immediately added to Madhubi's recusal list maintained with SEBI when Dhawal was appointed in this position. Now, in two statements yesterday, Madhavi Puri Butch has emphasized repeatedly that all disclosures and recusal norms of SEBI were diligently followed by her, and SEBI chief stated that instead of replying to show cause notice, Hindenburg has decided to attempt a character assassination of SEBI chairperson. Okay, thank you. Very well explained. Yash is also joining in with the details on the others in the Hindenburg's crosshairs. Yash. Hindenburg report just does not put the highest chair at SEBI in suspicions, but it also questions the institution and its conduct. It also questions Adani and its role. Blackstone, which is one of the largest players in the REIT space, along with brokerage firm 361, formerly known as IIFL Securities. Let's start with the allegations against SEBI itself. Hindenburg, in its report, has said that SEBI chairperson Madhvi Puri Butch and her husband Dhawal Butch had invested in offshore funds which were allegedly used by Adani to siphon off money. It was this investment which came in the way of SEBI's investigation against Adani and also the offshore funds in question. It is because of this why Hindenburg has also stated that SEBI can't be trusted as an objective arbitrator in the Adani matter. SEBI was also quick to respond on these particular allegations. The securities regulator has said that allegations made by Hindenburg have been duly investigated. Also, the chairperson had recused herself from these investigations for any potential conflict of interest. SEBI has also cautioned investors on the conduct of Hindenburg, stating that its disclaimer that it may have short positions in the entities mentioned in the report. Speaking about Hindenburg's allegation against the Adani Group, it says Adani used global offshore funds to siphon off money and reinvest them in the Indian market. SEBI chairperson's alleged involvement in the same funds came in the way of its investigation against Adani. Adani has called these reports malicious, mischievous and manipulative and being done with the intention of profiteering. An important clarification which Adani also gave was that it has no relation with any individuals mentioned in the Hindenburg report. 
Hindenburg has also questioned the offshore funds which were opened through 361 or IIFL. It says that these funds helped Adani siphon off money and reinvest them in Indian markets and also Adani Group stocks. The report has said that Madhvi Butch and husband invested in these funds opened by 361. 361 has said that these funds made zero investments in Adani. Uh, Madhvi Butch and Dhawal Butch holding in the fund were less than 1.5% of the total inflow into the funds, also saying that the funds are fully compliant with all applicable regulations. Another party against which Hindenburg has made serious allegations is Blackstone and Dhawal Butch's role uh, there as an advisor. The report says that Dhawal Butch's employment and Blackstone benefited from SEBI's regulations on REIT investments. Dhawal Butch, in his response, has said that his appointment at Blackstone predates Madhvi Butch's appointment as SEBI chairperson. Also, he says that at no point of time was there any association of him and the real estate side of Blackstone. Hindenburg sent a late-night counter asking if SEBI chairperson would commit to a full, transparent and public investigation into these issues. Amphi, which is also known as Associations of Mutual Funds, has said that they, uh, they, uh, they uh, on the recent criticism against SEBI chairperson, stand by her and it's an attempt to undermine India's market progress and added that India's financial system, uh, you know, is fostering growth and innovation with high integrity. Oh. All right. Uh, yes, thanks a lot for that. In fact, uh, let's listen in to what the DEA secretary had to say on the allegations against the SEBI chief. SEBI has made a present, uh, has given a statement. Chairperson has also made a uh, statement. I have nothing further to add on that. As I said that both of them have made uh, the concerned uh, person as well as the organization, regulator has made the statements and there is nothing further to, add, to be added by the government. So Okay, that's the big story for the day. For now, we get into a short break. On the other side, we'll invite the management of Neogen Chemicals to talk about their Q1 numbers and the way forward. Welcome back. Let's talk commodities. And now Manisha is joining in and she's focusing in on copper. Manisha. Well, thank you for that, Rima. Yes, copper prices seem to be rebounding smartly right now. Remember, we have seen the prices decline by 12% in the past month. Copper prices did fall to a four-month lows as well. But some bit of uh, buying seems to be now emerging, as you can see on your screens as well. This is after better-than-expected data that we've seen come in from China. The inflation numbers came in better than what the street was anticipating. You also have uh, stronger U.S. data now coming in. And the rate cut expectations now seem to be getting stronger. If you look at the Shanghai copper inventories, well, we have have seen almost 23% of decline into that from the month of June. And then there are also potential strikes uh, uh, looming in on Escondida mines there. And that's exactly where the positive cues really end. Because when you look at the markets, otherwise, the Elumi cash discount still stands tall at $123 per ton as compared to a three-month contract there. So out of China, the, the demand still seems to be struggling and we have seen higher inventories. The fund managers also, when you look at their net long positions, that has come down by 80 7% since the month of May and the buying there hasn't resumed yet. So these are a couple of factors that the street will be watching for. But the markets do believe that after that 22% of decline from its all-time highs in sense of copper from this year, perhaps the markets are now close to bottom and some opportunity buying could be happening. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Well, copper prices off their four-month lows. But Sony Patnayak from GM, GM Financial Services is joining in for a quick technical check of the market. Uh, Sony, this is such a resilient market, right? I mean, at every point, this market bounces back and how? And today as well, I mean, it's a bounce back about 200 points from the day's lows. How are you feeling about that? What do you do for the rest of the day? And any interesting stocks that stand out for you now? Hey, good morning, Sonia. Thank you for having me on the show. I think, yes, definitely we can see Nifty has bounced back, but the support is around 24,200, which is still quite intact. And as long as the support is not breaking, you know, you can, we can see higher levels of maybe 24,500, 550 levels that can get tested. So there's a bout of short covering coming in Nifty only above the levels of 24,350 odd levels, which it's almost a hovering and, you know, sustaining above that. 
so I think we can see it heading towards 24, 500, 550. Uh, there could be some sort of resistance around those levels. So maybe again, you know, a bit of a profit booking from those levels. Uh, but the overall broader range remains quite intact and there can be a gradual rise in the market as we go on. I think similar for Bank Nifty, uh, 50,000, 51,000, a thousand point range of uh, in a consolidation and Bank Nifty has seen good support uh, of 50 to 50,200, 50,400 on intraday basis. Holding those support, there's a chance that Bank Nifty can also test its resistance level of 51,000, 51,100. And any move above this resistance, you can see Bank Nifty reclaiming its 52,000, but that will definitely be a positional play. So I think it's just a bit of a uh, you know wait and watch for indices. Uh, when it comes to the stock specific, we've got two stocks which are giving a good breakout today on intraday charts. The first would be Petronet LNG. Uh, which has given a very strong breakout on intraday charts at the back of fresh long builder positions. Uh, so one can buy Petronet at, at current levels of 370.71, keeping a stop loss of 360, and a target of 385 to 390 for a positional play can be seen. The second pick comes in for PFC, which is consolidating in a very good range of 480 as a good support. On the higher side, 500, 510 is a resistance. So one can accumulate PFC at current levels, keeping a stop loss of 480 and a target of 540. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that. Let's talk about Sun TV under pressure, 9% lower after numbers mistreat expectations. There is a Motilal Oswal downgrade too. Vamakshi joins in with the details. Vamakshi. Well, absolutely. It's a weak set of numbers for Sun TV. When we look at the revenue, it came in at 1,276 crores. This is a downtick of 3% and a 2% miss as compared to the street expectations. Largely, this decline is being led by the advertising revenue, which saw a dip of almost 5%. Subscription revenue, too, was down 2%, and IPL revenue saw a downtick of almost 3%. EBITDA margin came in at 55.4% for the company. This is down nearly 433 basis points as compared to the same quarter last year and is much lower as compared to street expectations of around 60.3 percent and this decline is largely being led by a decline in revenue as well as higher operating expenses uh, which were up almost 7 percent and other expenses. EBITDA resultantly came in a nearly 10 percent lower it's a 10 percent miss as well as compared to expectations and net profit was down nearly 6 percent some uh, some support came through from the other income which was up nearly 21%. A couple of brokerage notes on Sun TV. Motila Loswal is, uh, has downgraded its uh, rating to neutral from buy. They've given a target price of 860 per share. They say that prolonged weakness was seen in the ad revenue. Risk around market share loss, strong competition from deep pocketed OTT players continued to pose concerns for the company. They have gone ahead and cut their EBITDA estimates by around 10% each for FY25 and 26. They're expecting a revenue pack tagger of 3% each for FY24 to 26. Overall, Motila Oswal has downgraded its rating on this counter. But Novama, on the other hand, has retained its buy call, target price of 1,075. They say that due to a weak performance in Q1, they too are trimming their FY25 and 26 EPS estimates by around 4% each. But with ad spends by FMCG players on the rise, they're expecting a revenue pickup going forward. And any unlock value unlocking in its IPL team could be a re-rating trigger as well. So overall, uh, Sun TV has reported a weak set of numbers. We have the Motila Oswal while downgrade coming in as well. The stock is under pressure as of now. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for that, Vamakshi. We'll slip into a quick break. More on the markets and uh, on lots of buzzing stocks coming up on the other side. Stay with us. So Neogen Chemicals reported a good set of first quarter numbers. The revenues were up 9%. According to the company, the revenue growth was led by volume growth. Harin Kanani, the managing director at Neogen Chemicals, joins us now to discuss their Q1 performance and the outlook for FY25. Harin, thanks a lot for joining and appreciate your time here. Good numbers coming through for the company. But I just wanted to start by asking you about pricing because, you know, you had mentioned last time around that pricing continues to be under pressure. Is there any possibility of it improving from here on? How is the situation on the ground right now? And what's the expectation for FY25? So I think on the pricing, you know, we have basically seen that the lowest price of our raw material, lithium and bromine, we have seen. And also, you know, from our competition in China, they have been very aggressive last one, one and a half year. But most of the places we have seen the lowest prices uh, and then now maybe the prices are slightly remaining stable or recovering. Overall, as a market, what we have seen is 
we have seen a very good response and interest in our beauty chemicals uh, related organolithium molecules so those are doing very well we have started some revenue contribution coming even from our battery material business we have seen pharma almost stabilize and improve except for the pricing part there's a good volume growth we are seeing there we are seeing also volume growth in our inorganic lithium uh, agro still remains a bit of a concern and there are still uh, like you know other initiatives which we have taken advanced intermediates in pharma and our csm business in other industries uh, which including some semiconductor related projects which we hope will basically allow us to you know make up for in case agro doesn't recover fully or we we still see headwinds in the agro sector okay you said uh, the battery material business also contributed in the current quarter how much did it contribute and uh, you know if you could give us say the exit contribution of battery materials by fi25 end so uh, you know uh, battery the battery sales were mostly related to uh, only uh, like you know trial sales for all the three segments so some lithium basic lithium salts as well as advanced lithium salts uh, electrolyte salt as well as trial production trial sales of our electrolyte so it was basically uh, trial sales in single digit in crore terms uh, so not a very large from contribution point of view but we are happy this is the first quarter when the plant even though it's not yet fully uh, fully capitalized and not fully operational but still we were able to get this kind of revenue from the part uh, part capacities which have come online so that's a positive start on the battery overall we have estimated this year it will contribute somewhere around 75 to 100 crore but uh, next year when this capacity will be fully utilized we see a revenue of at least 250 crores on top of that additional capacity is brownfield expansion which we are undertaking that this year as they get approved they will contribute and also our greenfield site which is almost 10 times bigger uh, that also is coming online in next financial year so next financial year we'll see contribution full contribution from the existing capacities new brownfield capacities as well as uh, the greenfield so it will be 250 crore plus the contribution of the new capacities which are coming online uh, together this capacities can, on full utilization can contribute almost 2500 crore so we'll keep a watch uh, like you know how much we can do next year but fi 27 is when we'll have uh, all the capacities available uh, for the full year Okay, so when these capacities come on stream, and you know when it contributes to your revenues, I'm sure there's some amount of debt that you would be taking up as well, because I understand that you're expecting a debt of fifteen hundred crores over the next three years. Will that be the peak debt, or do you think that it could get higher than that? So I think fifteen hundred crores is the total capex which we are doing, of which the okay. debt component would be around eleven hundred, twelve hundred crore. Uh, yeah, including our working capital in the main business and some capex. 1500 crore would be like the peak debt is what we are today saying uh, i think we also kept an option to raise more equity if needed uh, in the future uh, it can be in the form of either a strategic uh, in our battery business or uh, like just raising uh, like more equity in your journey if needed so we'll keep a watch on the debt equity ratio depending on how well the battery business develops and depending on the business needs but that seems to be the peak that we are expecting at least based on projections which we've seen now mm. what will margins look like because on one hand pricing is going to remain subdued they may it may not recover even through the course of this year but you are seeing increasing contribution uh, from the battery business uh, so what would consolidated margins look like for you in fi25 fi26 so on a full utilization basis you know our so sorry let me go back our base business of pharma agro uh at least fi25 fi26 you know on a once the margins recover we can be somewhere around 18% to 20% range uh once markets recover a bit and uh the battery business we have given a bit of margins of around like basically it's roc driven so we are targeting a 20% roc kind of margins there but on a bit of basis depending on price of lithium it can be somewhere around 16 17% on a bit of so that's basically the margin so let's say on a full utilization basis neogen chemicals traditional business including organolithium can deliver on a good year 18 20% kind of margins let's say on the lower side around 16 to 18% what we are seeing the trend 
in last one year. And the battery business, ROC base is around uh, 20% plus, but on margins, maybe around 16 odd percent EBITDA is what we are expecting. But that's on full utilization. So this year, you're not yes. going to have full utilization. The revenue contribution is only going to be 7,500 crores. And even the base business is not going to go back to the optimum pricing. Uh, so yes. what can we expect for margins this year? I think this year, uh, like, you know, again, the capacity is also not coming fully. So, like, as we don't have full utilization, we don't also have all the full expenses also. So we are still targeting, let's say, 16 to 18%, 19% kind of, between 16 to 19% kind of a broader range because this business is just starting up. It's a bit more difficult to predict more accurate. Otherwise, mm -hmm. normally I like to give plus or minus 1% range. Uh, but because of the uncertainty, I would like to basically maintain a 16 to 19% kind of EBITDA range for the current year. Okay, we'll leave it at that. Thanks a lot for joining in and all the best for the quarters to come. Uh, let's take a short break on that note. On the other side, we'll discuss the market fundamentals. Ashi Anand of IME Capital will be joining in. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Let's get a market conversation going. Ashi Anand from IEM, IME Capital is now with us and he's here with us in the studio now. Ashi, we always start the discussion with your digital disruptors portfolio. 25% sure. holding in Zomato. PB Fintech is up 21%. Well, you've got a new entrant, Ola Electric. Uh, does that fit the criteria for digital disruption? Did you analyze it and what were your thoughts? So we have analyzed it, right? Okay. And uh, we're actually a little confused on whether it really does fit or not. And I'll, I'll explain why. Uh, the core element of digital disruption is we, it's very important that there are very strong competitive barriers to entry. And you want the platforms that we're investing in, we want them to emerge as one of the dominant players. I think you don't yet have that answer when it comes to electric two-wheelers. Mm. Uh, what market shares are likely to be three, five, seven years down the line? Uh, Ola Electric clearly has strengths. Uh, they do have a certain right to win. We don't, however, yet know whether that is established enough and how that, uh, as Hero and Bajaj and TVS get their act together, what eventual market shares are likely to be and what profitability is likely to be. Mm -hmm. I think that is still uncertain. Okay. And that is the main reason so why, why not. So why not play it for two years, three years, till competition picks up? Because today, Ola is a dominant player. Uh, so the main, see, uh, the fund is structured as a quasi-private equity fund. Okay. Uh, we are looking at playing longer-term disproportionate returns that can get generated. Uh, even as of right now, right, what is... Pricing would be what's profitability going to be in the near term mm. uh, for electric two-wheeler players. It's still very, very nascent stages. Mm. Uh, we may evaluate taking a small stake in it just mm. to have it in the portfolio. Uh, but I think just generally the core element of the digital disruption portfolio is that very clear right to win. Mm. Uh, becoming a dominant player, being around for the next five years and having a profit pool, which could be very, very large, which you can really uh, enjoy. Also at a time when the electric two-wheeler space itself is seeing some demand slow down, right? So the broadening of the sector is something which is also being questioned right now, the widening of the sector. But I take your point entirely. Um, do you feel that, you know, given the fact that Ola is discounting heavily, even at the moment, right, 25, 30,000 rupees, it would be a, lo um, a longer journey to profitability because once they sort of take those discounts out, then perhaps it could be a bigger impact on demand. So I'm just trying to understand, in terms of a timeline, what are you looking at for profitability? So that is essentially our concern, mm. right? You don't have clarity around that. Okay. Uh, and what's happening is that with uh, ICE two-wheelers moving towards um, EV, mm. your entrenched players, the Bajajs, the heroes, they cannot let new competition come in and really disrupt. Mm. Uh, you'd be willing to kind of play off profits and they have cash flows to allow losses to happen on the EV for a sustained period of time. So we're not very clear how long it is going to take before the space turns profitable. Mm. And that is our main concern. Uh, we also okay, as in we were okay investing in a Zomato, investing in a PB FinTech. At the time, they were losing big amounts of money. As in we launched our fund in Feb. Uh, when everyone was looking at the hundreds of crores of losses. But 
what we did have was a clear path to profitability. Uh, I'm sure Ola Electric also has it, but the moment we need an industry to stabilize mm -hmm. before really taking big bets. Uh, so since you spoke about Zomato, I just want to follow up there. I mean, you have 25% weightage, right, in in that yes. stock, and of course it's done phenomenally well. But for somehow someone it's been who's... a five bagger for us. Yeah, like, we, we recently just crossed five. Yeah, yeah. and some um, it was a leap of faith for a lot of people, right, because of the trajectory that Zomato has had. But now, if someone's missed out on this rally, is it too late? We don't think so. Uh, so I think but the main call is the moment you're now investing in a Zomato the, at 250 plus kind of levels, uh, you need Blinkit to work, mm. right? At about 50, 100, 150, uh, just on the pure food delivery system, there was a tremendous amount of value that we were seeing. However, the moment it becomes at these kind of levels, uh, you are now expect, uh, ascribing about 50% of value plus mm. for Blinkit. And that is a space where competitive dynamics are still to kind of evolve. We clearly believe that uh, Blinkit has very clear rights to win. We've discussed this in the channel as well. Uh, so we do expect that to work. Mm. But I think the moment becomes 250, 260, um, arguably it, it has become a slightly more tough call. We don't, like a 5x in the near term is probably in, like, yeah. extremely unlikely. Okay. Uh, so in since we are on the subject of this digital portfolio, any changes that you've made in the last one month, post the Q1 numbers, Anything that stands out for you? Any changes that you would recommend to your portfolio? No, so this is, it's positioned as a private equity Correct. fund. Correct, so no right? changes. As in, yeah, it's really, really stable. I think the main changes we've had to make in the portfolio has happened more because of risk control. Okay, so uh, because Zomato of risk kept, control, yeah, so, are you, have you made changes? So what happens is Zomato keeps going up above 25%. We have a 25% limit. So Got then it. we have to trim and move it towards other places. Okay. Uh, we've started adopting a bit more of a string of pearls approach. Mm. Uh, so there are certain companies where we may not be as convinced as of today, mm. but clearly there is some interesting value coming in. So like? Ola Electric, for example, could be an example. Mm. So what we're looking at is possibly having small exposures to some of these companies. So you start tracking them that much closer, they come oh. into the portfolio mm. uh, and you could possibly increase weights as the as these companies evolve. So in your microtrends PMS, right, very interesting uh, names is what you have here. I mean, of course, we've spoken about Zomato, there's also PB Fintech, there is uh, 361, which is really growing right now. In this whole financialization of savings space, there's a lot of companies as well, HDFC, Asset Management, HDFC Life. What are the big trends that you notice over the next, say, one to two years? What stand so, out for you? You know, financialization of savings is a decade. As in, I, I think it's the next 10, 20 years. It's a very clear structural kind of play. But uh, something like an HDFC life has been frustrating for investors, right? Over the last two, three years has given you absolutely no return. So, But there were specific reasons, right? So if you look at it, we actually didn't buy HDFC life until a few months back. Okay. Uh, there was a very specific tax uh, change tax. that happened, right? Yeah. Which fundamentally impacted growth. You had, um, for a certain period of time, you, there was going to be a year, year and a half when nothing was going to happen in this company. Mm. Uh, we basically waited for that whole base effect to go away. But fundamentally, if you're just looking at um, financialization of savings as a theme, be it insurance, be it uh, capital, be it AMCs, be it wealth management firms, we're seeing very, very attractive growth here. Mm. What we are seeing away from are brokers. We're seeing away from pure DMAT players because we believe that Retail participation in direct equities and especially in FNO Correct. has probably run well ahead of itself. You are seeing the regulator coming in and trying to make some changes to try to uh, impact this. So you are seeing some kind of risk in those segments. We're staying away from that. But I think if you're looking at mutual funds, life insurance, all of this looks very comfortable to us. And uh, one more word on uh, Titan, because it is, uh, you know, stock, I mean, it, you hold about 2% of Titan in one of your funds. Uh, it's facing competitive headwinds. Some of the smaller players are doing better. Uh, so why not look at some of these mid-cap companies which are growing faster in uh, the jewelry so, space? So just the way Microtrends is positioned, uh, it's positioned as a large and mid-cap portfolio. Mm. We believe that we can deliver outperformance to the overall markets by taking concentrated exposures in certain okay. micro-trends while staying in the large and mid-cap space. So why not trend? Hmm? So we, we, we are evaluating, right? As a, I, I, I don't, don't want to get okay, into okay. a specific yeah. company, specific <laughs> thing or whatever, but right. yeah, yeah. We, we are evaluating. We are aware of Titan and the competitive dynamics having changed, etc. That said, we believe Titan remains a very, very strong franchise. Okay. Okay. There are some near-term headwinds, but we still see large... Head, a very large headroom head for growth, growth and we believe the market 
can support a number of players all the way doing well. Okay, well, your uh, your fund does have a lot of businesses that are, have been ahead of the curve and are growing in this tech space. So, congratulations uh, on that. And thank you so much for coming into our studios today. Thank you so much. For thank you. Me. Enjoy Bombay. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Okay, well, on that note, let's do one thing. Let's take a quick commercial break. On the other side of the break, lots more coming up on the markets and individual stocks. So don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Trading Hour on CNBC TV 18. Well, for now, the market, just a quick word on it, is actually not bad. Look at that. I mean, you know, one would have thought that post the Hindenburg report and post all of the fear surrounding it, the market would have taken a hit. But no, there's a big bounce back that's happened at the moment. And a lot of stocks in focus. Hero Motor Corp comes out with their earnings tomorrow. Ahead of that, the stock is up and about, up almost about 2 or percent. And then a lot of these winners are piling on their gains. So whether it's a Jubilant Food, whether it's an Inox Wind, whether it's Ola Electric, of course, has been an upper circuit all along. And then a couple of these other stocks like Hoodco, etc. are doing pretty well. The entire PSU space has come back in a big way. Ircon, Sale, Gale, IRFC, all of them looking pretty good. So it's really a healthy looking market that we have on our hands. But Amara Raja Energy and Mobility has unveiled its Giga factory just outside Hyderabad. They've set up an investment of 9,500 crores. The company will build battery packs and lithium ion cells for electric two and three wheelers. Our colleague Jude Sanit spoke to the management about these developments and what it means for the capacity, expansion and more. As we slip into a short break, listen in. The facility we're in today is our PAC facility that we've inaugurated the phase one of. This facility today houses about 1.5 gigawatt hour of PAC manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And today we have our two-wheeler and three-wheeler lines up and running. And uh, eventually this facility will house about five gigawatt hour of PAC manufacturing. This facility I think is largely catered to light electric mobility which we're very bullish on. Mm -hmm. We think that the trends of electrification in two-wheeler and three-wheeler uh, they may kind of, you know, they may slow down at times, mm -hmm. but uh, mostly we don't believe that these segments are going to go backwards. I think the electrification uh, route is clear. Mm -hmm. It's uh, unidirectional. Mm -hmm. uh, we are seeing a lot more, you know, movement on the passenger vehicle side. A mm -hmm. uh, little less on the penetration numbers, but definitely we are quite bullish that India will adopt the EV story, mm -hmm. especially because I think uh, for our cost points, our, we are a very value vehicle-minded uh, 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 country. And some of the brands that have come in and been able to crack, you know, that uh, that uh, price that price point and the kind of the features, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's definitely going to go up, and we feel that we're in a good position to capture that. Aethers, uh, you know, they have a, a huge amount of data and uh, user experience that they have from the, all the bikes and the kilometers they've traveled, mm -hmm. the way the number of packs and cells they have already, you know, installed in the market. So a lot of that is going to be made available to us to exactly spec the type of cell that they feel is going to be most relevant to succeed in the Indian road conditions. Mm -hmm. And by the time we start manufacturing our cells here, I think we'll have a very good design and we'll be able to you right. know, give that to Aether to start and many other two other manufacturers. Okay. Uh, with Piaggio, we are working on, you know, a, actually it's a, it's a pretty expansive relationship we have with them. Mm -hmm. We started about uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, we started with packs and chargers. And now we're into, you know, a second or third generation of pack. Mm -hmm. uh, next generation of chargers just coming off our lines in a, a town called Digomagam in Andhra Pradesh. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we've agreed today also is in addition to this firm fixed business over the next few years, mm -hmm. also localizing cells inside these packs mm -hmm. is now on the anvil.